Good afternoon. It is 6 p.m. June 9, 2022. A quarter order of the Mercedes ISD School Board of Trustees meeting. We have a quorum. Myself, Vice President, Ms. Delgado, Secretary, Mr. Martinez, uh, Mr. Howe, Ms. Trevino, and Dr. Castillo. Absent is Mr. Acosta and Mr. Garza. We now follow up with a pledge of allegiance by Trustee um, Ms. Trevino, invocation by Trustee Mrs. Delgado. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this hour asking for your presence and help as we are gathered here today. Be with us in our discussions and guide our hearts and our minds in spirit of fairness, right thought, and speech. Lord God, there are many things that we are dealing with at once. We pray for your guidance so that we may seek your will in everything we do. Inspire us to solve the challenges we face. Guide us as leaders and let our courage never fail. Bless us with peace and strength to continue our work and that our decisions may reflect what is right and good. Dear Lord, grant us the humility to always seek your will in all that we do and say. We ask and pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Thank you, Mr. Delgado and Mr. Trevino. Uh, moving along with the agenda, we have the uh, open forum. Uh, Ms. Clark, do we have anybody? Yes, sir. Okay, just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Let me go ahead and read a brief little uh, uh, statement. Uh, the next item on the agenda is open forum for public comment. Before we begin, I will remind our audience members of the board's procedures for handling public comment. The public comment portion of our meeting is available to the members of the public who wish to address an agenda item to be considered by the board on tonight's agenda. Anyone who wants to speak during the public comment must sign in prior to the start of the meeting and list the agenda item they want to discuss. Each public comment speaker will be allowed a maximum of five minutes to address the board. However, any public tes testimony speaker who requires a translator will receive up to 10 minutes to address the board. The public comment portion of the meeting will allow all speakers who have signed up before the start of the meeting to address the board regarding an item on tonight's agenda. Please keep your comments or criticisms civil and courteous. Please also avoid using profanity and refrain from making personal attacks on others during your opportunity to speak. Last, we ask that you do not discuss students who are not your own child. If a speaker is seeking board resolution of a specific, specific complaint, that concern should be addressed through the district's grievance process. District policy DGBA has been established for addressing employee complaints. Policy FNG is the avenue for filing parent complaints and policy GF addresses community member complaints. Grievance forms can be obtained at any campus administration office or in the central administration offices. Thank you, and our first speaker is? Jaime Castaneda. Welcome, Mr. Castaneda. start again sure thank you I'm here to speak about uh, item one executive session which would be resignation termination appointment valuation per professional professional I'm here to speak that nobody has been held accountable for the allegations that have happened here at Mercedes ISD 
There has not been justice done. One person was arrested this past week, and I believe she felt the entire school body, not only the students, but the administration, the staff as well. In order to move in the right direction, I feel that we should hire a legal counsel to come do the investigations or allow the investigations or the investigators from Mercedes Police Department to do their job without interfering the way it happened these last couple of uh, arrests. I know a couple of months ago I was arrested for exposing an elected official, right? And I was arrested with an injustice. And now their beloved friend is arrested and now guess what? She has a mugshot too. The only difference between her mugshot and my mugshot is that I was never covering for a child molester. I was never covering up for somebody who was exposing a penis out there. And I was never covering up for somebody who was abusing a, 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 a child with a disability. Okay. okay. We're okay? Okay. Proceed, sir. Thank you. That is the difference. I was fighting for the students at Mercedes ISD. And I would do it again and again and again and again. I don't regret my arrest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Castaneda. Anyone next? Ms. Next is Ms. Yolanda Molina. Welcome, Ms. Molina. Good evening. Uh, my name is Yolanda Molina, former employee here for Mercedes ISD for 34 years, retired in 2011. I have always been an advocate for the children because all of the schools and everybody that is hired is hired because there's children. We serve children. We don't have to love them to death. We don't have to like them. But we do have to work with them and we are adults and we need to be very professional. In saying that, I believe, and it's not only what I believe, I know it should be happening, that we should have the best of the best for our kids because those are the children, those children are the ones signing the paycheck for every school employee, regardless of what they do. Whether they're funded state, federal, or local, it is taxpayers' money, it comes from families that have children. And so when we forget that, then maybe we need to rethink about what we wanna do. And that also applies to people that represent children, like a school board. It's not about us, it's not about what's gonna be written in our obituary, the things that we have done. It is about putting your life on the line for the children, your future. This could be your children, your grandkids, your neighbors, your nieces and nephews. And they come in all colors, all shapes, and all characters. And we have an enormous responsibility. The reason I'm saying this, because I'm gonna get to the point where I had a very small conversation. I asked a security guard a while back. And those of you that know me, I don't hide when I have to ask something. I'll ask you point blank. Either you have an answer or you don't. And I can tell when you're not coming across the way you should. As you know, I served on the board of directors for the NEA for a number of years and I lobbied and I traveled to DC to do this not knowing much, being a dropout. I was able to do that. So I learned a few things along the way. I asked the security guard, point blank, sir, would you put your life on the line for a student? And the person says, not for minimum wage. That told me a lot. I know that we have uh, agencies that hire people. I don't know what the screening is all about, what they ask, but I know that they're not there to lose money, they're there to make money. And if they can hire a security guard for minimum wage, they're gonna take that person. They are. They're in the business of making money. And I even gonna say this, and it might come back to me, maybe it's not about saving lives, it's a business. Our children are not a business. Our children are the future. And if you really represent them, if you really care about them, and you want to be remembered as an advocate for our community, 
We need to start looking into how we do things. We look into the little things that don't matter. We're talking about lives here. I don't know whether we are going to be hiring professional policemen. I don't know. But I sure hope that you put a dollar sign on those kids, that they are worth something more than just showing up with somebody with no gun. I don't know how they can protect the child. One of the things that we need to do here now is we really need to start thinking seriously about what you all want to do. You want to represent educators and students? Or is it about you having something to do? Because people will remember what you have done or what you have failed to do. The other thing is, when I call a board member, it's not about how you're doing. It's about what needs to be done as a taxpayer, I have the right. I am a grandmother of three children. Two of them come to these public schools. And they matter to me. And I will not hesitate an inch to call up a board member and say, I have something to share with you. Can you help me? But when they shut me down, believe me, I will never call that individual again. As far as I know, that type of individual doesn't represent anybody, anywhere. And if you care to know who it was, you can always ask me later. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ms. William. Next. Okay. Uh, moving along, guys, with the agenda is uh, Superintendent's Report A, Student Recognition, Mercedes FFA, uh, Deborah Rebel, CTE Director. Dr. Castillo. Yes, good evening, Board. President, Board of Trustees, Mercedes ISD community and staff. At this time, we do have student recognition by our CT director, Ms. Rebel. Good evening, School Board of Trustees, Assistant Superintendent, Dr. Nancy Castillo, Mercedes ISD uh, staff, and the community members of Mercedes. Tonight, I would like to congratulate, uh, congratulate Kayla Zuniga and Maria Perales as both of these Mercedes FFA uh, members will receive the highest degree of membership at the State FFA Association. Those wishing to receive their Lone Star degree must have been an active FFA member for at least two years, complete at least four semesters of agricultural science at or above the ninth grade level, maintain a supervised agricultural experience program, compete in career and leadership development at district, area, and state level, demonstrate their leadership skills and show a commitment to the FFA through involvement at the chapter level and above. This degree of active membership is awarded at the state level during the Texas FFA convention, which will be taking place next month in July. Kayla and Maria were also elected as district officers of the Citrus Valley District FFA, and this is the first time in Mercedes history that we've had two representatives at the district level. Um, although they cannot be here tonight, uh, I did want to take the time to recognize our two amazing students. Thank you. Okay, uh, B, graduation recognition. Dr. Castillo. Our graduation for the class of 2022 was an outstanding event, and at this time we would like to present a video provided by our public relations department in recognition of our graduates, uh, also our gratitude to all those working behind the scenes. On behalf of the Mercedes Independent School District and the Board of Trustees, a big thank you is extended to all the individuals that work behind the scenes to make the 2022 graduation a huge success. Thank you to the following groups, the Maintenance Department, Safe Schools Department, Custodial Department, Band, JROTC, Faculty, City Officials, Mercedes Police Department, Security, Campus Administration, Counselors, CTE director, and most of all, the senior parents for providing a memorable ending with the display of the fireworks.
Well, on behalf of the board, guys, uh, I'm so very happy to see the, the time and the effort that you did. I think it was a first class. It, it was a fantastic graduation. And I've, uh, I've attended quite a bit, but this was probably the number one. So that's from the University of Texas, PSJ, and all the way to Mercedes. This was number one. I really like the fireworks. Job well done, guys, so thank you. I don't know if anyone wants to go ahead and add any comments. Yes, um, yes, I would also like to thank everyone, everyone there. Um, Mr. Handy, you know, you too. Thank you, I know you were there very early. Um, everyone stepped up to it, everyone. It was, it was hot, um, there was a long line, but this is, the, this is what's to come, you know, safety, security. Um, I know there was a lot of concerns and, and all these administrators, principals, and, and they, they took care of things. And um, I really appreciate it. Definitely, um, we will work. We will continue to work to make those changes. And it's all, you know, it's, it's for the safety for our families, for our students. And uh, know that we are here. We're going to be, we're going to be supporting you with everything that comes up as far as changes in our school districts. Uh, we're we're going to be there, and we're here to support you. Thank you so much. Any more comments, guys? Okay, moving along to uh, presentation uh, number one. Preliminary uh, spring 2022 star EOC testing results, reading, math, science, and social studies by Dr. Nessica Castillo. Good evening. At this time, I'd like to present the preliminary spring 2022 star EOC testing results in reading, math, science, and social studies. I do want to make note that we did receive from the um, Testing Communication Center, as far as Texas Testing Communication, that any school district in the, in the state of Texas that tested in paper, those scores will not be available, uh, especially in math because of the gridable island items until June 14th at the end of the day. So we left one campus out, so you will see the scores a little uh, low. So starting off with the Mercedes ISD third grade reading, we had a number of students of 293. Uh, you can see in orange, it, burnt orange is approaches, meets is in black, and masters is in um, I believe it's in gray. And so you'll see the breakdown in Mercedes, 60%, followed by JFK, Inujosa, Travis, and Taylor. And considering the impact of COVID, reading is a very difficult uh, assessment, including writing. And so for the scores to be at this level, they're comparable, and we can see the scores will be rising in the next grade level when the cohort moves to fourth grade. In fourth grade, we had 269, and you can see the pattern again for Mercedes ISD, 62% uh, as far as approaches, meets is 35%, 14% would be your masters. And then you have the breakdown by elementary. Fifth grade reading, we had a number of 305, and again, Mercedes ISD, 71%, followed by JFK. In uh, Ojosa, Travis, and Taylor, so Mercedes ISD, 71% approaches meets 42% and 22% masters. Reading sixth grade, 334, approaches 55%, meets 24%, masters 10%, and we have Chacon and Harrow Middle Schools. Seventh grade reading, 332 students, 67% Mercedes ISD, 33% uh, meets, 19% masters, and again followed by the two middle schools. Eighth grade reading, 324 students, 65% Mercedes ISD in approaches, meets 32%, master 17%, followed by Chacon and Harrow Middle School. English one, this is semester two or year long classes, 504 students, including the two middle schools, 67% Mercedes ISD, 52% would be the uh, meets and masters is 5%. And you have the Mercedes High School, Mercedes Early College Academy, Mercedes Academic Academy, Chacon, and Harrow. English two, 339 students, Mercedes ISD 48%, meets 26%, and master's zero. And we do wanna let you know that eventually these will be aggregated the summer, the December, and the May. So it's a three cycle when we get the final in the fall. Then we move into mathematics, third grade mathematics, 292, 
Uh, here we were at 49% for Mercedes, meets 28%, 10% masters, and you can see the breakdown uh, by the four elementary. Fourth grade mathematics, 269, 61% would be our uh, approaches, meets 27%, masters 9%, followed by the four elementary schools. Fifth grade mathematics, 304 students, 71% the district, 67% you can see JFK, Hinojosa 86, Travis 62, and Taylor 70%. And when it comes to the district, it meets 35%, masters 11%. And this is where I did make a, I have a legend in yellow that tells you that the results for uh, Chaco, uh, excuse me, yes, Chacon will not be in until June the 14th and I will have an update. So as far as the two, those scores are low, but once those come in, we will see Chacon scores comparable to the district and Harrow. Seventh grade, again, they took the test paper-based, and so we should be receiving those scores in, on June the 14th. And eighth grade math, 163 students, but we're still lacking those students from Chacon Middle School. Algebra one, 76% Mercedes ISD, Mercedes High, Mecca, Ma, Chacon, and Harrow. And you'll see the 76% it approaches meets 47%, masters 33%. Fifth grade science, 302 students, 52% Mercedes ISD. Uh, we have uh, also, we have the meets at 22%, master's 7%, and you will see the four elementaries. Eighth grade science, 371 students, Mercedes ISD 58%, 27% would be your meets, and master's is 7%, followed by the two middle schools. Biology, 279 students, Mercedes ISD 53%, 15% would be your meets, and a pro, a master's would be 1%, followed by the three high schools. Eighth grade social studies, 371 students tested, Mercedes ISD 41%, that's approaches, meets is 14%, master's is 5%, followed by the two middle schools. U.S. History, 232 students tested, approaches 86%, meets 56%, masters 25%, followed by the three high schools. And that is the end of the presentation. Any questions, guys, comments? Um, Dr. Castillo. Yes. Uh, for those students that struggled with the test, what kind of uh, tutoring are we giving them this summer or what, what, is, what is your plan for them? So our plan that we have uh, an accelerated learning coordinator and we work with the middle school, the high school, and the elementary, high impact tutorials. So we, do, we did uh, start meeting. We selected the students that did not fare on the benchmark and we sort of went from that list and was a large group that were recommended for the summer program. Once the scores came in, then we filtered those students out that passed and we took the students that didn't pass and we put them in for uh, tutorials there in the summer for elementary, middle, and high. That was gonna be my next question. I know that you did benchmarks at the beginning just to see where they were at and then you yes, took this test. So I'm wondering, do you know the percentage of- Not of offhand, them? but we do have the presentation. Uh, there was an increase. There was an increase. We saw an increase. We were, we were amazed. We, we were um, applauded our, our schools because they did have increases. What do you think the, is the hardest subject for them? Mathematics. Uh, the mathematics. It's so across the state. It's across the state, yeah, okay. All right, yes, thank you, Dr. Castillo. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A quick question, ma'am. Yes, sir. I think it's uh, fair to ask, ma'am. Is there any, mm -hmm. any possibility when you have a chance that we have a uh, comparison to other school districts, please? Yes, sir. Well, we we, chance, we are working. Our we have a great data fellow, uh, Mona Guerra. She's okay. been getting all the data for us, and it's a great comparison. But we can't release it until the fall when it gets released through Region One. But we do talk amongst our colleagues in other districts, and we kind of share data. Okay. And we did very good in in reading. Okay, fair We're enough. really excited to see those scores. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, moving along, guys. C2, uh, 
Texas Education Agency requirements for elementary bilingual programs by Vanjie Gracia, bilingual director. Mr. Chairman, at this time, our next presentation is by Ms. Vanjie Gracia, bilingual director, who will present the Texas Education Agency requirements for elementary bilingual programs. Good evening, Dr. Castillo, board president, board members, our MISD staff, and community. Uh, this evening, I wanted to share with you uh, the requirements that we will have to follow for next year. Go ahead. So for next year, basically what they're telling us is that at the elementary level, pre-K through fifth grade, we can no longer combine our bilingual students with our non-bilingual students within the same classroom. And for our bilingual students, the way that they are identified is based on when a parent registers a child, they fill out a home language survey. That home language survey asks them two questions. What is the language spoken at home and what is the language that the child speaks? If any of those two have Spanish, English, English, Spanish, 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 or another language, that is an indication to us as a district that we have to assess these kids with a language proficiency test. Once we do that, then every campus has an LPAC committee and their job is to look at the scores of the child. We test them in English, we test them in Spanish. If they are at the lower levels of English proficiency, then that's an indicator to us that they need to be served in a bilingual program, okay? So we recommend to the parent, the committee, not we, but the, each campus committee recommends to the parent, you know, we tested your child, this was their proficiency level, but it's up to the parent to decide if they want their child to participate or not, okay? But if the students fall in the beginner intermediate levels of English language proficiency, then it is our responsibility to place them in a, in, in a more Spanish instruction, to give them more Spanish instruction, because they still need that instruction. Once the kids get to advanced and advanced high levels of English proficiency, then we can start to give them more English instruction. And of course, they have to meet a criteria that's set up by the state to exit the program, okay? So since the goals, language of instruction, and teacher certification requirements differ between a bilingual program and just a regular general ed program, uh, basically TEA is saying that we cannot serve both populations with fidelity within the same classroom, okay? So, and this is just letting us know that we can, to some extent, with, for instruction, okay, separate the students, but for activities such as PE, art, music, their recess, their lunch, then we would, of course, have to have all our students together, general ed students and our bilingual students. And this, again, comes from TEA. Basically, they're telling us that we can, as a district, locate our bilingual program on specific campuses within the district for the purpose of combining resources to support a full and equitable program and maximize our staff. So as a parent, uh, because let's say that the, the child is going to qualify, or we're gonna recommend that the child qualify for the bilingual program, we have to let the parent know, okay, that uh, that bilingual program is not going to be offered at this campus, but it will be offered at, an, at a separate campus. It is up to the parent to choose to stay at the campus of their, uh, I guess their, their home campus. If they do that though, they're basically denying the bilingual program, the services that a bilingual program offers, okay? Uh, but again, that's the, the right of a parent to do that. Uh, we do have to provide them the services of the bilingual program at the other campus, and we do have to let the parents know of the benefits of having them stay in the bilingual program, which is what we're recommending, okay? So again, it is a decision of the parent whether or not they want to uh, approve their placement of their child in the program or deny it. But if they do deny the bilingual program placement, then there are some implications, and all of these are instructional. Uh, and these are, the student is then not allowed to receive instructional, uh, instructional accommodations in the classroom. Uh, they still have to take their TELPAS exam until they meet the exit criteria uh, that is established by the state. Uh, and for that to happen, they have to be advanced high in all four domains, listening, speaking, reading, and writing of the TELPAS test. They have to be successful in their star reading also, 
That's either star reading third through eighth grade or their EOC test for English one or two, okay? Uh, if the parent denies the program, then they're not allowed to test in Spanish in third through fifth grade, okay? Uh, they're not allowed to receive any testing accommodations either, okay? Uh, for our students that are within their first three years of being in a U.S. school, okay, our newcomer students, uh, if the parent has denied the program, we cannot allow them the English One special provision. So basically what that does is if a student comes in, let's say at high school, and they're taking English One and they're taking the course and they pass the course but do not pass the end of course assessment, they're, they're exempt. They don't have to take that because the state realizes they're learning a language, so they're giving them time to develop that language. And even if the child is, in, is, is denied the bilingual program, the LPAC committee at each campus still has to review their academic prog progress every six weeks or nine weeks, okay? And we have to keep making sure uh, if they're not progressing, it's the LPAC's responsibility to let the parent know, you know, your child is not participating in the program, and they are struggling academic, academically, would you reconsider, reconsider putting them back in the program? Good. And this is just to let us know that as a district, uh, it's, it's basically a district decision to provide transportation, but we will be providing transportation to these students. This is what TEA uh, basically asked us to do in this process this year, and we have done, we've completed all of these steps. We had to look at PEAMS reports by campus, by grade level, uh, to see where did we have our kids, what type of instruction were they receiving, was it in English, was it in Spanish, uh, talk to our principals about these changes, uh, develop a plan of action. We had staffing meetings with HR to see how many teachers do we have that are bilingually certified, what grades are they, uh, and then we uh, uh, had to assign teachers, certified teachers in the bilingual classrooms. So all of these things have been completed as of now. And this is just the, our district timeline of the things that we've done to prepare for this change. Okay, so in February, we had an initial meeting with central office staff, uh, February 23rd, uh, meeting on the changes with our elementary principals. May 6th, it was meeting on updates to the bilingual program changes with the, I'm sorry, May 10th, sorry, meeting with the changes with the Taylor staff because it would, it's gonna impact Taylor staff and then Travis staff on May 12th. May 17th, we notified Taylor and Travis teachers that will be re reassigned for next school year. And then May 18th, we had a Travis parent meeting. And then May 25th, a Taylor parent meeting. And I forgot to include in this timeline, on April 19th, uh, I presented to the board these changes that were gonna be happening. So some of the considerations that were taken into account before making this final decision of course, we looked at, like I said earlier, the language of instruction of, of our bilingual students by grade, by campus. How many certified teachers do we have at each campus? Okay. Uh, the number of our bilingual students. And you'll see in the next slide that we've actually decreased our number. We've lost bilingual students. Uh, we looked at transportation routes and we looked at prior uh, campus STARS scores. And that was before COVID scores. Okay. And then we looked at current TELPAS results. So here is one of the data pieces that we looked at. This is what the state uh, basically holds us, holds districts accountable for. What they want is 36% of our students to either be advanced high in the TELPAS test composite score or to have increased a proficiency level. So if I'm an intermediate student at the beginning of the year, they want me to increase to advanced. Uh, the state uh, progress rate was at 46%, so they exceeded what they want us to be at. The region was at 45%. Mercedes was at 45%, so we met the region. Uh, and what I did there was I included all the four elementaries. So you can see that Hinojosa and JFK, each, each, each campus score there, Hinojosa and JFK exceeded both their state and the region in this area. So this is our information on our certified teachers here in the district. In the 2020-21 school year, we lost 11 bilingually certified teachers in our district throughout the four elementary campuses. In this school year, we had to apply for a TEA bilingual exception for 10 elementary teachers. 
So what that is, is that by November 1st, if you're serving bilingual students with a teacher that's not certified, you have to apply to TEA for a, an exemption. Um, and so we had to do that for 10 teachers. Uh, during this school year, because you apply for an exception, you also have to set aside 10% of your state bilingual funds to actually train teachers to try and get them to become certified. You have to provide them resources. So that's the amount of money that we had to set aside to do these things. And then throughout this school year, even though we only had 10 teachers on, a, on an exception, we actually trained 18 elementary teachers because we're trying to recruit others. Uh, and of those 18, only one teacher was able to become certified as of Friday, June 3rd. And the reason for that is that exam is very difficult to to be successful in. It's two exams that they have to take. They have to take a bilingual supplement, and then they take what's called a BTLPT, and in that one, the teachers have to be fluent in Spanish. They have to write in Spanish, read, answer questions, um, create a lesson plan. It, it, it's a challenging test. This is just a copy of the letter that we received from TEA basically letting us know that our application for the exemption for those 10 teachers was approved and basically what they're letting us know is that we, as a, they're asking us as a district to make sure that we're doing what we have to do, which is train our teachers and, and get them to, to be successful on the test, to make sure that we're doing this because the more bilingually certified teachers we have, it'll help our kids be successful on TEKS, which eventually will help them become prepared for post-secondary success. So this is what I, we've lost students. This is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, this is another reason that we had to look at combining campuses because we've decreased students that are identified bilingual throughout the years. Go ahead. And what this is, is by campus, if this is, these are the numbers that we looked off based off of PEAMS and off of you know, classroom rosters. And this is what we saw. Um, and this kind of led us to the decision that we couldn't stay as is because then we would need more teachers. We would need to hire more teachers. And you can see there when you see that it says, you know, 10 EB students uh, receiving Spanish instruction, two EB students receiving English instruction. Again, that is based off of where those students are in their English language proficiency level. And so in looking at that, we realized we, you know, those counts are very small, you know, 13 students, 12 students, you know, 15 students. So in looking at, and you have it there by campus, JFK, there's Taylor. It lets you know how many teachers we would need to, to add. Go ahead and go to the next one. This is Travis and Hinojosa. So it's, it's, okay, so then for next year, okay, if we were to serve our bilingual students at each campus, in other words, stay as is, have all our bilingual students at all four, uh, we would need to hire 16 additional teachers, six of which would have to be bilingually certified. Uh, and 10 general ed teachers, okay? If we were to serve our bilingual students at two campuses, we would only need to hire either between four to five general ed teachers. In other words, if we combine campuses, we're covered with our bilingual teachers uh, in, our general, in our regular ed class, classes. We might have some life skills teachers that are still not bilingually certified, but those are, those are a few. And the reason why I put four or five is because we're still not sure on pre-K three counts, so we don't know if it's either four or five yet. So this is basically what we're uh, proposing or recommending that our kids from Travis, would, our bilingual students would be relocated to Hinojosa with their bilingual students and their regular non-bilingual students. Okay, so Hinojosa would stay at it as is. We would just bring in the bilingual students from Travis and then the same thing for our Taylor kids would go to JFK, and JFK would stay as is. And basically that is it. Any questions? Question, guys, comments? How, um, you mentioned you had been meeting with the parents. Um, yes. The last few weeks. What's the, uh, what's the feedback? It's understandable they're, they're upset because of the move. Mm -hmm. um, they understand, though, uh, I wanted to thank the Travis and the Taylor administrators because when we did meet with them, uh, par some parents stayed behind to talk to them, and the administrators were 
very upfront with them and letting them know, you know, you're, let's say the child was a fourth grader and he tested with, instruct, with testing accommodations. So they were sharing that with them, you know, if, if you want to continue, you know, receiving these testing accommodations, you would have to stay in the program. And, you know, it, it is uh, not something that they want to do, mm -hmm. but some parents at the meetings did realize, you know, I, I, know, I know my child needs that support. And that's basically what we told them. If they're at the lower levels of English proficiency, mm -hmm. we, we need to continue to serve them. Thank you. Fair Any enough. Other? Any questions, guys? Comments? Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Uh, number three, roofing project update, relocation update by Rolando Herrera, maintenance director. Dr. Castillo. Yes, Mr. Sherman, our next presentation is Rolando Herrera, maintenance director, will present the roofing project update and relocation update. Good evening, uh, Dr. Castillo, uh, Board President, Mr. Hernandez, trustees, community staff. Uh, today we have a presentation uh, to give you um, the summary of the uh, projects that we are recommending to move forward with. Originally we had three projects that uh, we did a roof assessment, uh, which we uh, knew were priority projects. This included the Mercedes High School G and E wing, Chacon, um, Sergeant Chacon uh, Gym, administration building, which is now your early college campus, and the old gym at the high school. Uh, based on the budget availability, uh, we have two roofing systems, the single ply TPO, the modified Bentium. Uh, so Robert Kishner uh, did provide some estimates to identify the cost associated with the different roof systems. Now based on the, on the uh, budget availability, uh, which is, if you look in, 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 uh, on, the, on the bottom of the table, uh, budget availability uh, district funding is 1.2 million. Uh, disaster funding, which was allocated in the beginning of the year, uh, is 736,000. Uh, is a cumulative of 1,936,000 uh, funding available. Now, in order to cover three roof systems, if you can scroll down again, Mr. Handy, uh, or up, I'm sorry. This would cover the three, sing the three roof systems for under the single ply TPO. Uh, which the, the administrative fees from the engineering firm uh, included in the total uh, would be 1,565,632, uh, leaving the old gym at the high school pending for next year, uh, considering we have the funding for it. Um, and so this is the recommendation based on the budget. I know uh, we probably ha we have questions on the difference of in the roof system. So today with us, we also have Robert Kishner to answer any questions. Uh, warranties, uh, the lifespan of the roof system. Uh, Mr. Amaya, uh, with us today is Mr. Amaya and Mr. Alejandro. Welcome, gentlemen. If you have any questions at this time uh, based on, on the difference of the roof systems or warranties or the lifespan of each roof system, um, the gentleman would be able to answer. Well, the question I have, how long will it last if we go ahead and do the upgrades and the repairs? Every, everything that we propose to you regarding uh, the two different systems will have a warranty. Can you speak up a little bit closer? Good. Everything that we have proposed regarding the two roof systems, whether it's a modified uh, bitumen system or a single ply system, you have an NDO warranty, a no dollar limit of 20 years or plus. Any other questions, guys? What's the main difference between the two buildings? I mean, the roof system? A single ply system is created, almost, uh, in simple terms, it's more like a rubberized, uh, has some key alloys. It's the way the product is made. It's usually. Like a cool seal? It's like a, it's a, a covering. Cool seal? Style? No, it's, it's mechanically fastened compared to a modified bitumen, which is asphalt based which you mop on or you can torch on or, or cold applied. And one of the, the difference, there's a big difference between them, uh, but the cost factor also helps when it comes to the single ply. Now, one of the reasons we went with this way was obviously the budget, but it also, you have some, uh, it helps regarding, say, energy efficiency because it's 
white and it radiates. Mm -hmm. So in the long term, you'll actually see some savings back when it comes to your energy versus the modified bitumen systems. Now, both systems are very good, you know, but based on the budget, we have to give you our best assessment of what we can go from here and give you the best roof systems that we can, can find for you. And uh, on a single ply system, uh, you know, to give you a history of how they're used, the majority of the HEBs here in, in the valley throughout the state of Texas use single ply systems versus the modifieds. One of the reasons was their roof systems are very congested, they had a lot of traffic. So they went with the, the single plies because they're easier to maintain. Uh, when it comes to maintenance, the cost factor after, say, the warranty exceeded, it costs more to come fix a modified. Uh, but like I said, both systems are very good. We don't have a preference to one over the other. We're just here to basically give you the best for what your budget allows. Now, I'll add to that, when it comes to the applicators, all of them need to be certified by the manufacturer. We don't use uh, products that are over the counter, that you can go buy locally. These our manufacturers, they are, it's uh, certified, registered, and you get a warranty. 1-800 number gives you how the, the lifespan of the roof system, how to maintain it, and you call them anytime there's an issue, and they'll send a certified applicator to take care of any problems. As long as it's not negligence, you know, somebody goes out there, starts creating, adding new stuff to the roof system without a certified applicator. Uh, this is the best uh, in regards for your protection. I was just thinking right now, sir. So uh, if we decide to go a specific type, and let's say it's a 20 year warranty on it, but we don't necessarily get 100% money back, we get a depreciation? Is that about right? Or should I ask Tony about uh, that? Could you repeat that again, I'm sorry? Uh, I would say if we decide to go with a, a a, uh, a roof that's going to give us a 20 year warranty. Let's say we have some issues the 15th year. Do we get a 100% uh, warranty or do they give us a depreciation on it? Yeah, what, what is called NDL, no dollar limit, is a warranty that's not prorated. Let's okay. suppose it's a million dollar roof and in the year 10, <laughs> material is found to be defective and has to be replaced. Okay the manufacturer is not going to come and say, oh, well, you've already used half of the lifespan of this warranty, so you have to put, Mercedes has to pay half of the replacement cost. That's, that's not the NDL okay. warranty. Okay, so perfect, thank you. Yes. Well, it's covered that's what it means, no dollar limit. That means they'll replace it, in labor and material. Nice, okay. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Um, we'll both have the 20 year warranty. Uh, yes, you know, because yes. there's a different pricing, but will they? Yes. Uh, really, uh, the warranty is if there's a failure of materials. Mm -hmm. And with most major manufacturers now, they have, uh, they have their chemical composition, they have adjusted it very well, and rarely you see failure in materials. They're not what they used to be 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, when, when the single plies came initially, they had a lot of problems. Uh -huh. And it was in the United States because of, of cost, uh, uh, price engineering. Uh, most of these systems were initially developed in Germany and they had no problems there ever. Yeah. But now most manufacturers really know what they're doing and <laughs> there's, there are no failures in material. Nice. Thank on you. On top of that, on, on, the, on your warranties, on your no dollar limits, you also get a workmanship warranty from your applicator, wherever the subcontractor is. Uh, typically, they go between, say, two to five years, depending on the contract, which means that when the job is complete, they're obligated for at least those first two years after the roof system's installed, that they're responsible if any, any issues should arise. At, at no cost to the school district. That's just part of the contract. That's to protect you. And it runs concurrently with the existing warranty. Thank you. That would be covered under their bond, I'm sure. 
Yeah, you know. Yeah, with obviously, yeah. Uh, sir, how about uh, the maintenance? What's the uh, responsibility of the school district about the maintenance on these uh, these roofs? I'm just curious about it. You know, I know it's Mr. Adada's business, but I'm just curious about once, it. Once the roof systems are, are, are complete, you, the manufacturer and or the subcontractor, whoever the applicator is or the installer, they give you closing documents and it tells you how to take care of the system. Uh, there's also some do's and some don'ts. You know, you can't just call somebody to come and install an, an air conditioned unit without an approved applicator there because they might use the wrong materials. You know, and that's you don't want to do that. And that's how we're, that's how we get into problems when people start using stuff that doesn't relate to the existing system. Mm -hmm. So all that's covered under all the closing documents. Okay. How long would it take to install? Well, there we do have a schedule that, that was presented. Um, the, the single ply is in the budget, right? Yes. Uh, yes, we have a thing in the, uh, the, the disaster funding is available. Uh, I think we're pending uh, approval of. of Oh, okay. Uh, just for your info, the main building of the high school has a single ply. It's a PVC, it's not the TPO. There's a slight difference in the chemical composition, but it is a single ply uh, on the main building. And so far, it's, it was installed back in 2007, 2008. Yeah. And well. Yeah. And it's, it's holding really well. Yeah. The, 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 the maintenance guys have to know that if there's an accident, for example, a, a ladder or a toolbox falls and there's a cut in the membrane, they want to mark it and report it immediately. And, and they have to know that they're okay if it was an accident, it was an accident, but mark it and, and uh, you know, make a temporary patch and call the manufacturer. Right, so the maintenance is going to be more of just cleaning it, like pot with a power, power washing it. No, po that's no too power. No power. That, that yeah. can break it. Yeah. Or it, crack it. Yeah, with a hose and something soft. Yeah. Yes. Okay. In, in this situation, you got paraffin walls throughout the majority of the roofs, uh, the, the systems in the your, your, the buildings. So you really can't see the system to begin with. The roof systems are so. Uh, uh, you have a very uh, good uh, drainage, the, the water flow, uh, the water just is non-existent on some areas that all be uh, uh, corrected. So uh, as long as nobody's out there doing something, throwing trash and things like that, you know, the roof system should be pretty clean. Now also at that time, if you have some facilities that are no longer in use, uh, excuse me, uh, rooftop units that are no longer in use, it's best to remove them at that time. The less penetrations on a roof system, the better. So handle with care, basically. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of picturing like a high grade commercial full seal. Is that kind of what it is? Well, this, in, this system- In layman's terms? Right? This system is a, a rubberized uh, system. They usually come between say, Three and a half feet to five feet, six feet, twelve feet, eight feet, twelve feet in width, depending. But the thickness. The thickness you can go. This is a sixty mil TPO. It's a uh, very durable. What's that uh, in inches? Well, well, that's in mils and in inches. Well, that, that's. It's, it's no. between one sixteenth and one eighth. Yeah. And it depends what kind of backing material it has. If it's uh, the, the 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 pure TPO would be somewhere between one eighth, one sixteenth to one eighth. Plus minus. No, it's it, it. You have to really. It it has to be something heavy with a sharp black. For example, someone has an accident, yeah. and a toolbox, something heavy, falls, and with an angle, hits the roof to make. You really want to have to, want to damage to it to, to to cause some, some damage to it. But like with anything else, you know, there are certain things to protect it, especially if you're investing this type of money. You know. Follow the guidelines, follow, follow the instructions that are given to you, and you shouldn't have any issues. Also, we have the uh, tentative timeline 
uh, available. Uh, upon approval, uh, this is the timeline that, a tentative timeline that uh, was provided by uh, Robert Kishner uh, so that you have an idea of the, of the timeline that it would take uh, for the roof systems to be in place. Uh, the design phase, the bidding, the proposal deadline, ranking and negotiations, board approval, and the construction. So it's, it's pretty much falling right, right, right in line and just slightly over. So I don't see any issues there. So that looks good. That's okay. It'll get, it'll get us through, through the room. We might have a few days that we might have some days there that we might, you know, uh, uh, need a little extra to finish it up, but it, it, won't, it won't take too long. Correct? Some of these, uh, these, these are these are just uh, phases that we have to follow um, as procedure. Now I know there's a delay uh, due to uh, material availability. Uh, that is one of the biggest factors. Um, the, and, and they have expressed uh, that concern, uh, but they're saying that the, the material is becoming more available, so we're hoping that um, we have that situation so that we can be on time with each of the uh, tentative dates. All right. Okay, any more questions, guys? Comments? Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Castillo, just real quick, uh, can we follow up on the claims on the roof? I know Mr. Howe had brought up the claims about the insurance. Can we follow up on that? So, should have taken care of that a long time ago, but yes, just take care of it now. Um, okay, and the summary, uh, I guess on yes, sir. Go ahead, Mr. On the summary on the relocation of the uh, administration building uh, and Mecca. Uh, currently here at, at the administration building, we've already moved out the superintendent's office, federal programs, bilingual program, and safe schools uh, department. Uh, pending uh, is still business office and HR because we're waiting on the network installation at the building. Uh, the building is ready. We're just waiting uh, for network availability. Uh, the curriculum department will be moved uh, or relocated tomorrow. Uh, CNS is pending um, the availability of the building and uh, special education depart department as well is just waiting on uh, building availability. So it's kind of, I have to move one department so I can put in another department. So it, it's just moving components uh, and that's the, the, the phase that's taken a little bit of time. However, we're ahead of schedule and uh, I'm glad because we also, as you heard, the bilingual department will also have relocation of teachers uh, going from one campus to the other. So we wanna make sure that we are, are, have everybody in place physically by July, mid-July. Now physically I mean tables, chairs, resources, books, whatever is within our control. Uh, and that is the plan and, and that's why we're working Fridays and possibly Saturdays. We are taking into consideration our staff. Our staff is, is, is very supportive. Our teachers and our administrators have, uh, have um, followed up with all the recommendations, labeling their tables, labeling their chairs, labeling their uh, everything, which makes things a lot easier for our, te for, for, our, for our team when we go in there. We want to make sure that we go from room two to room three. Uh, we don't want to make any mistakes or lose any material because we know it's, it's, it's time sensitive and it's less work for us if we just do it right the first time. Due to the closing of one of the possible campuses due to the bilingual program, would the early college been available to inherit that campus? The early, uh, like moving to the that old, the, old, the previous building mm -hmm. or the new building? The new building. The new building, well, we have a proposed relocation plan that was presented uh, the last uh, meeting. Um, and it, it gives you the, the different locations for each department. Uh, I, Mrs. Castillo will present a, uh, a modified plan uh, but that's 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 a presentation, I guess, that Ms. Ms. Casio can can provide for all of you. Thank you. Just to go back a little bit, um, in reference to uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, he mentioned the claim. Has an adjuster contacted you yet? On what claim? 
Well, we're going to get a claim started for the for the roofs. Okay. Okay. Has has that has the ball gone? Okay. No. Mr. Herrera, I noticed um, safe schools. What is it? Is going to safe schools, uh, ten employees auditorium building. Yes, they're in the auditorium area and also the um, the counseling center area, uh, the pre for Mecca, the previous location. So yes, ma'am. Is is that safe? The building is. Uh, the building is. That, just that section. Yes, that section. That section was remodeled. Uh, I'm assuming 2013, 2012, which was the auditorium area. That area right there is still protected with our fire alarm uh, system. The other buildings, the other extensions do not have the same protection. Uh, and the fire marshal did do a walkthrough of the building to ensure that uh, we were taking the right steps to uh, protect our staff. How many, um, how many offices are there? Or, or, or uh, what's the uh, capacity? You know, auditorium, as? there's two, uh, there's uh, four offices. Uh -huh. uh, counseling center, you have your counter, your, your front counter, and you have a big classroom and two in, uh, smaller offices. Uh, the, the staff uh, fits, uh, they do need some storage area, which we're gonna actually clean out tomorrow. Uh, Early College still had some supplies. Uh, there, so tomorrow our staff's also going to go in there and make sure we box all supplies and bring them over to the new early college uh, location to make those storage uh, areas available. Was that on the original plan? No, the original plan had uh, safe schools at the old administration building. Uh, noted there were three employees only, but they have uh, they have more employees. Mr. Canales, how many employees do you have? How did how did they go from three to ten? They have um, the counseling, uh, and I guess the um, nursing. I had the two LPCs that weren't accounted for. Uh, my truancy off uh, my um, homebound teachers. Um, Yeah, instead of three, we have more that we're not counted for. That was the issue. Uh, that, cent that central office building, I was there, and uh, that office space, it could only house two people, my, my secretary and myself. But the nurse was left out, the head nurse, uh, and my two L LPCs, my two homebound teachers, and I'm, I know I'm missing someone. No, truancy is in the campuses. Where are they currently at right now? The who? Truancy. Truancy, homebound. they're right now at the high school, and I have one at Chacon. Two at the high school, one at Chacon. At the beginning of the year, I'm going to put one in Taylor, no, Travis, so they can be scattered throughout the district and helping the, the parents. Now, you mentioned your nurses. Aren't there nurses at the campus? Yes, though? it's my head nurse, oh. my head nurse. I know she has other nurses that assist uh, they're there to, uh, you know, assist in the other schools, but sometimes they need to be there for training with Ms. Pustamante, and they need to house stuff. We have a little added room there. We use that as storage and for whoever needs to be there uh, to assist. Mr. Herrera, are, are they moved already? Yes. Yes, we are. I I'd like to, uh, if you can, Mr. Canales, give us a actual count of your Absolutely. employees. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, or Ms. Dr. Castillo, if you can go through Dr. Castillo and then we, we do have it. We do have it, ma'am, but I didn't know okay. I had to present today. Okay. okay. Any questions? I know that uh, the uh, one of the um, also requests for information. Uh, was the associated cost up to date? Oh. Uh, uh, currently, uh, we're at 8,712. Uh, a big piece of the cost uh, are the air quality tests. Uh, they range from 1,500 to 2,500. Uh, so that's uh, uh, the bigger cost there. I know it's important, and we have them made, we have them done. Uh, and everything else is just a cost of emergency lights, uh, receptacles, upgrades at each of the buildings. So they're in compliance. We do do a walkthrough with our fire marshal at all times uh, because when a building becomes unoccupied and reoccupied, uh, it has to meet the current standards. 
Uh, and so uh, he's, we have to follow his recommendations to make sure the building is in compliance. Um, I know that also in addition to that, you, you wanted to follow up with the uh, curriculum department, our air quality recommendations. Uh, we have completed all nine with the exception of one, all ten exception of one, which is nine, uh, and that's for a retest. Uh, the information was provided to Ms. Castillo. Uh, it is, it is, you have it available. If you need further explanations on it, please feel free to, to ask. I'm sorry. So there was another test completed or? No, the, 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 there was some oh, the air quality, air quality uh, recommendations that oh, we had to complete for the old curriculum building. Yes. Uh, and we completed the recommendations uh, that were provided mm -hmm. uh, with the exception of one, which is uh, we have a retest. Uh, but that's at the hands of, you know, we can, we can discuss uh, and move forward with it if it's uh, needed. Okay. Fair enough. Any more questions, guys, comments? One, one more question, I'm sorry. You mentioned a, an amount, uh, total costs right now uh, with all the moves and because they, you haven't been painting or doing any remodeling and you know anything like that right so so cost is about eight thousand dollars for right yes, now eight thousand seven hundred and it's just a, it's just moving uh, uh no not moving uh the air quality uh tests there you go. associated um some uh air uh, uh fire panel uh repairs that we had to do the old hr building uh and uh, i have them here uh gaskets vans uh rings uh emergency lights a conduit uh we had to build a small wall uh, in one of the offices just to have a, you know, enough room for two individuals. It is a big, uh, large office, so mm -hmm. we wanted to make sure that there was uh, two people that could fit in there. So we do have a list of, of items that we've, uh, we've spent okay. for, those, for the move. Thank you. Um, and in your experience, you know, the years that you've been doing this, uh, is that a good amount? Is that a, I mean, are you surprised with the amount right thus far that it's, 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 it's the cost of uh, any, any building we do repairs, yeah. uh, whether we're replacing receptacles here, whether we're adding a light, a new light fixture, uh, these are costs associated with updating any building. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, they're, they're very common. You know, it's something that, you know, we just uh, we keep track yeah. and, and make sure that they're in place. And it's in-house? Everything's yes. been done in-house? Exception of the air quality yeah. test uh, <laughs> and whatever uh, licensed, uh, like uh, fire alarms, those are not in-house. Those are, those, are, uh, those are companies that have to, that are licensed. Thank you, sir. Okay. Move on, guys. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Uh, C for 2022-2023 budget presentation, Delia Garcia, see about. Dr. Garcia. Mr. Chairman, at this time we have our presentation by Delia Garcia, CFO, who will present the 2022-2023 budget presentation number one. Good evening, Mr. Board President, trustees, Dr. Castillo and community. Before you is the budget presentation for the 22-23 school year. This budget will be based on 3,773 ADA, which is approximately 183 lower than the 21-22 adjusted ADA. It is projected that both enrollment and ADA will have a 5% to a 6% decrease next school year. Another budget assumption is that there will be an 8% growth in property values and that the district will collect 95% of the assessed tax levy. In May, Proposition 2 passed, increasing the homestead exemption from 25,000 to 40,000, which has been taken into account as well. Additionally, the MNO tax rate is expected to be compressed further, which will cause a decrease in tax revenue. It is important to note that the higher property value growth causes more tax rate compression. The district's maximum compressed tax rate will be determined until late July once property values are certified. The enrollment and ADA projections are reflected in the following graph. Over the last couple of years, enrollment has had 5% decrease and it is expected for this trend to continue for the next school year. 4,160 students are expected to enroll. 
Therefore, 3,773 in ADA will be used to calculate revenue and set up the 22-23 district budget. The impact to funding for the loss in ADA is estimated to be $1.2 million in revenue. Ma'am, can I interject real quick? And Dr. Castillo, maybe you can help us out because we have the enrollment of 41 six. Well, let's just do 2021, 22. And that's just a, a discussion amongst the board and the public because it needs to be addressed. It's, we have uh, the enrollment at 4,418 and uh, we actually put that on the, uh, the website for the superintendent's application, but yet we have the ADA 3,956. I mean, that, that's a huge variance. Mm -hmm. So it, it catches my eye and I think it's fair to discuss it to see why is there such a, a, a very large variance. Uh, Dr. Castillo or Ms. Garcia, maybe you can elaborate why that's Sir, what if you would do? allow for me to continue, I address that in okay. my next slides. Fair enough, fair enough. Next, the projected enrollment for 22-23 school year is shown by campus. These enrollment projections reflect the student counts with the bilingual placements at Hinojosa Elementary and JFK. The district strives to have an attendance rate at 95%. However, the budget will be set based on 93% of attendance. The change in both enrollment and ADA is broken down in the tables to show a better visual of how they have decreased over the last five years. The 21-22 average daily attendance in the asterisks is estimated based on the adjusted ADA and the 22-23 enrollment and ADA are projected based on that 5% decrease. Overall, if 258 students are lost in enrollment next year, the enrollment change will be 1,370 students, and the ADA change will be 1,235. Now I'm going to address the summary, to give a summary of where ADA will end up in the current fiscal year. The 21-22% in attendance is currently at 89.47%. However, the current year ADA will be adjusted by the 2019-2020 target percentage attendance rate known as TPR, TPAR of 94.48. So that gives you an, uh, an answer for what's happening this school year. During the 21-22 school year, the district experienced a loss in ADA due to the low rates of attendance caused by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. As we know, a decrease in ADA means less funding is generated. To mitigate against the loss, TEA devised a mechanism to assist school districts by calculating the 2019-2020 target attendance rate and adjusting the 21-22 ADA. This is different from the whole harmless uh, adjustments given in the past because it does not protect the, di the district from enrollment loss. It just adjusts attendance to pre-pandemic levels. Next, the ADA adjustment is explained further. The 21-22 actual refined ADA for the first four six weeks is averaged out first. The district's first through fourth six weeks ADA average is 3,790. The 21-22 percent in attendance, which is outlined in the green, was 89.47 percent for that period. That number is divided by the 2019-2020 target percentage attendance of 94.48 to derive at the ADA adjustment of 1.056, which is in the yellow. The first through fourth six weeks ADA of 3,790 is multiplied by the 1.056, and ADA is adjust, adjusted up to 4,002. The adjusted ADA of 4,002 
is then averaged out with the fifth and the, and the sixth six weeks to come up with a new estimate of 3,955, which is the number that you saw in the, in the previous yeah. slide. Okay. Without this adjustment, ADA would have been approximately 3,834. The gain of 121 ADA equates to approximately $740,000 in revenue that the district would have lost if the adjustment right. did not exist. And that's due to the attendance. Next year, the district is eligible to adopt disaster pennies due to winter storm Uri. Before I continue, was there any other questions with regards to ADA? In January 2021, Governor Abbott declared statewide disaster in response to the winter storm. Since disaster pennies are eligible to be adopted the year after which the disaster occurs, the district may adopt them for next fiscal year. These are not in addition to the disaster pennies we adopted this year, since disaster pennies are only uh, good for one year. When working with us, with estimating revenue, the district looks at locally certified property values and state certified property values. The locally certified property values are determined by the Hidalgo County Appraisal District. They exclude the value of properties in the over 65 tax ceiling and they are used to calculate the property tax liability for our taxpayers. These values determine tax collection revenue for the district. The state certified property values are certified by the state comptroller. These values must be appealed or protested by the district to change them. They recognize a portion of the value of properties with the over 65 tax ceiling and they are used by TEA to determine the district's MNO and INA state aid. In this slide, the property values are shown. The district has seen an 8% increase in property values in the last couple of years. The preliminary estimate for the 22 tax year is 735 million in property value, which represents an 8% growth. It is important to note that the 2022 property values are used in to calculate funding for the 22-23 school year. House Bill 3 provides for using the current rather than the preceding taxable values of property in calculating a, the district's local share of the foundation school program. In summary, higher property values mean less state aid and more tax compression. Next is the estimated tax revenue based on the certified estimate of 703 million received from the Hidalgo County Appraisal District. The preliminary tax rate shown includes adoption of disaster pennies for the winter storm, but it does not include tax compression. Once the, district, the district's maximum compressed tax rate is determined in late July, the tax collection estimates will be revised. If the district collects 95% of the levy, the district estimates to receive 6.7 million in maintenance and operation tax collections and 2.3 million in debt service tax collections. Are there any questions regarding taxes? In this slide, I will briefly touch up on the ESSER funding. At the end of 2020-2021, the ESSER II and the ESSER III grants were awarded to the district. The amounts are annotated there at the top. The period of availability for ESSER II grant goes through September 30th, 2023, with a carryover year. Approximately $4 million in staff will, are being funded through ESSER II, and as of April 2022, $3 million is still available to be spent. The period of availability for the ESSER III grant extends to September 30th, 2024. 
approximately 2.4 million issues to cover staff positions, and as of April 2022, 18.4 million is still available to be spent. Now we will cover employee compensation. Administration uh, proposes a retention stipend of 1,600 for the 22-23 school year. The pandemic has increased responsibilities for all district employees. Teachers and staff have been faced with increased workloads to feed students, clean classrooms, and close the learning gap. An $800 first installment will be paid in September 1st, 2022 for returning employees and a second installment of $800 will be paid in December 23, 2022 if approved by the board. Next option for employee compensation will be presented. TASB HR Services provided two salary increase options for the 22-23 school year. Option one would give an increase of 1,200 for all teachers, librarians, and RNs, 2% for administrative professionals, and 3% for clerical, instructional support, and auxiliary staff. Option two gives an increase of 1,500 for all teachers, librarians, and RNs, 3% for administrative professionals, and 4% for clerical, instructional support and auxiliary staff. In addition, TASB recommended salary adjustments will be made across all staffing categories. The next slide provides a cost of the salary increase of both options. Option one will increase payroll costs by $854,000 and option two will increase payroll costs by 1.1 million. Again, TASB recommended salary adjustments are included in those costs. TASB HR Services provided the following graph showing the market comparison for teacher pay against what the district currently pays. Teacher salaries at Mercedes are below market on all benchmark years. The orange line is Mercedes ISD, and the blue line represents the local market median. The following TASB table shows the teacher salary by years of experience. The current starting pay for Mercedes is $50,300, which is 98% of the market median of $51,500. The orange line in the table represents where the district ranks in comparison, comparison to our neighboring districts. The TASB pay system maintenance report provides benchmarks and market comparisons for all staff categories as well. I'm just mentioning, highlighting the teachers right now. Uh, and this concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Guys, any questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Okay, number five, guys. Culinary Arts Program by Deborah Rebel, uh, CTE Director. Mr. Chairman, at this time we have Deborah Rebel, CTE Director, will present the Culinary Arts Program, including uh, student enrollment. Okay. Uh, good evening again. Today I'm gonna to be talking to you all about the culinary arts program. Um, just some important information in regards to the program over the past years and of course the impact, we, which we've already heard about COVID as far as you know, on the numbers for this year. The objectives that I'll be covering tonight um, include the overview of the program, labor market information, Mercedes ISD data, goals, and of course new horizons. Looking at culinary arts overall, so culinary arts is one of the programs of study that we offer at in Mercedes ISD. It's one of several that we do offer at the high school. Uh, it falls within the hospitality and tourism career cluster, which is it falls under the business and industry endorsement. Um, 
if you're not familiar with the graduation plan, we have five different endor endorsements that we offer um, at the high school level, and one of them being the business and industry. This program introduces students to occupations and educational opportunities related to the planning, directing, coordination, and exploration of opportunities involved in directing and participating in the preparation and cooking of food. So it, it, it involves a lot more than just you know cooking the food. It's the planning, the management, everything, every aspect that has to do with it is involved. And it is covered with the students. There in that red box, this is directly from TEA, and it just reiterates what I just covered. You know, it focuses on the management, marketing, operations of restaurants and other food and beverage services, lodging, attractions, recreation events, and travel-related services. Students who are enrolled in this program acquire knowledge and skills, focusing on communication, time management, and customer service that meet industry standards, and students will then explore the history of the hospitality and tourism industry and examine characteristics needed for success. Now, when we look at the labor market information, you know, what kind of impact does this program of study have on our students? Um, when we look at the labor market information, I'm gonna do a comparison of the lower Rio Grande Valley, which were area 23, and of course in comparison then to the state. Here uh, in area 23, so this, this projection is for the 2020 through the 2030 uh, the decade for those 10 years. So it does show an increase in growth rate and median annual wage for the following. Uh, general and operations managers, there's an 11% increase for those careers and the median wage is 66,277. For chefs and head cooks, you're looking at a 41% increase and a median wage of 35,229. Uh, cooks at restaurants, you have a 64% increase and a median wage of $23,059. And cooks at fast food restaurants, there's a 58% uh, increase in a median wage of $19,409. One thing that I would like to bring to light in regards to that, you know, when we're looking at the numbers, that's a huge increase. But then you look at the wages and you're thinking, well, that's not really that high. But I wanna remind everybody that this is just, you know, an opportunity, a starting point for our students. Especially, you know, thinking about the new Sonic that's coming in. I know they've reached out to the district and they're looking to hire, you know, 50 to 60 of our, our high school students. This right here is going to help them. Our students are able to get their certifications and, you know, that is something that they can place on a resume. That right there will speak for itself. They are, if they can, if they have that industry-based certification, they are showing future prospective employees that they have the knowledge and skills that are needed and it's saving them time and money that the district is, is helping them with in order to get those careers. And of course, this is all a starting point. Um, you know, we all start somewhere, right? We all start somewhere, uh, and over time with experience, we grow from that point. Now, in comparison of our area to the state, you have a great, greater increase in the growth rate and median annual wage. Chefs and head cooks, there's a 45% increase, and the median wage is 49810 for meeting convention and event planners, you have a 22% increase in a median wage of 48,236, and food service managers, a 28% increase in a median wage of 49,126. So whether our students decide to stay here in the Rio Grande Valley, in our area, stay close to home, or they wanna venture out, we know very well that a lot of our students, you know, they graduate from Mercedes, they go off to different colleges, universities, some come back, and some don't. But either way, if they choose to have this area of focus, they will be good wherever they decide to stay. And we know very well that um, a lot of businesses are booming in Texas. A lot of companies are deciding to leave other states to come here to, to our great state. And so the opportunities and the jobs will be there. Okay, so the impact on Mercedes ISD. Different programs of study are offered at the high school. Well, let me culinary arts. Within a program of study, there are four levels that are offered within that specific program of study. You can see there that level one is the introduction to culinary arts, level two is the culinary arts class, level three is advanced culinary arts, and level four is food science. One uh, thing that I would like to, to stress right here is that that food science course, that fourth option within that program of study will count towards a student's science credit. So right there, they can kill two birds with one stone. You know, not only are they completing that program of study where they would become CTE completers, which is very important when you talk about accountability, but they are also getting that fourth credit that they need for graduation so they can receive that the distinguished level of achievement. 
Students in culinary arts also have the opportunity to take part in career and technical student organizations or CTSOs, specifically in the Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America or FCCLA. This promotes personal growth and leadership development. In Texas alone, there are over 23,000 members, over 550 local chapters, and over 1.9 million is awarded yearly in scholarships to Texas students. So the opportunities are endless for our kids. Okay, and I'm a very firm and strong believer in students taking part in these organizations because again, they're learning so much, um, especially with the, the leadership skills. And I think over this past year, we, we have highlighted our students and the different things that they have accomplished. And our kids are, are going to amazing heights and it's only gonna keep on going up from here. All right, so let's look at the comparison over the years. Um, Ms. Adriana Gonzalez, she's our culinary arts instructor. Um, I asked her when the program of study began at Mercedes ISD, and she stated it started in 2013. Now, you know, one thing coming out of the pandemic, we know that it took a big hit. And so the reason that I really wanted to go back to the 2017-18 school year is so we could see at a glance and be very transparent about how, you know, it impacted our program. I want to stress that this is not only an impact that was taken on culinary arts, but it was an impact that was made across all different programs of study, and not only in Mercedes ISD, but across all the school districts in the Valley and in the state. I have been to many meetings where you know, we, we, we've met with, uh, I've met with CT directors, and they're all saying the same thing. The numbers have decreased, okay? So looking at the 2017-2018 school year, now the numbers in orange, those are the students that are in the intro to culinary arts. This is made up mainly of your ninth and 10th graders. And then once you get to the black, um, the black color, that part of the graph, you have students who are both uh, enrolled in the culinary arts plus the advanced culinary arts. Now, we talk about contact hours when we have our CTE courses. An intro class, usually, you know, that's, that's one credit that they're getting. But once you start double blocking periods or you have more contact hours or minutes within a class, if you have 32 students at that point, you're looking at doubling that number because you're extending the amount of time, okay? So you can see in 2017-18, we have 57 students in intro, 32 in the advanced. Moving on to, there was an increase into the 2018-19 school year, it increased to 75 students. Um, and you have 29 students in the uh, advanced courses. 2019-20, again, another 75 students. You had an increase of 37 students in the advanced courses. 2020-2021, um, this is like, I guess you can say the last normal year before you know, COVID uh, showed up. Uh, you had 71 students in the intro, 38 in the advanced. After that, this school year, 21-2022, 28 students. So you can clearly see that decrease in the number of intro to culinary arts. As far as the advanced students, the ones who are in the culinary, the level two and level three courses, uh, for the most part, that stayed relatively close uh, to the previous year. And so right there, side by side, you can see the impact that it had on this program. Ma'am, can I interject real quick? Yes. Because, uh, you know, there's a concern about the early college movement and issues with the kitchen. Ma'am, I want to know, this past year, how many students total actually utilized the kitchen? The kitchen? So for every single class that was scheduled, um, all students were transported over from, from the high school here to the Culinary Arts Center. Um, the numbers you can see right there. So 28 students in the intro class and a total of 32 in the advanced courses. So they, they all actually utilized the kitchen? Yes, they did. Yeah, the course was here. And so it, it, there was no separation of, oh, instruction, you know, the, the intro classes are held at the high school and only the advanced students came here. All students were bused this way. Okay. okay, any other questions in regards to that? Okay, next slide. Now, I, I've already stated, you know, so what happened looking at this, this school year? Well, the big one is the impact of COVID. Um, when we think about that virtual learning year, right, it had a huge impact. Reason being, the 20, 19, 2020 school year, right? We went to spring break, we never came back. Mm -hmm. That was a very tough pill to swallow. Um, at that point, a lot of the activities that take place in the spring, you're talking about recruitment, the outreach to the middle schools, that never took place. And at that point, we, we went into uncharted waters. We were trying to figure out how do we, you know, how do we even educate our students through a computer? 
it was very tough. It was very tough. And so all educators at that point, we did what we could. We, we rose to the, um, to the situation and we did the best that we could. Now, going into the 2020-2021 school year, that was the virtual learning year. And again, that was a very difficult time because again, the opportunities to have the outreach to the middle schools to recruit students was very difficult. The only students who knew about culinary at that point were the ones who were already enrolled in those classes. And so when you go back, you backtrack to those years, the students that are currently here in the high school, you're looking at them being in middle school the last time that they were physically mm -hmm. on the campus. And now they're coming to the high school. Mm -hmm. And so they lost all those months there. And so that exposure wasn't there, the recruitment wasn't there, and that's why the numbers are low. Um, another reason, and again, attendance is a big one. This year, you know, we welcomed all of our students back, uh, but the fear of catching COVID was definitely there. And that's why there was a big toll on your ADA throughout the entire school year. Um, another reason is master scheduling. So depending if a student is involved in their extracurriculars, whether it be athletics, band, um, choir, dance, that takes up spots on their, on, from their schedule. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times, you know, those CT courses don't fit in, as well as students who are, are pursuing their associate's degrees. When they are taking all those dual enrollment courses, that lessens the opportunity for them to be enrolled in their electives. Now moving forward, you know, we can, we can look at the, the issues at hand, but you know, I'm very solution oriented, so what is the plan? So the vision, the vision is to provide the students of Mercedes, and not only culinary, but I'm talking about all programs of study at the high school. The vision is to provide the students of Mercedes various opportunities to learn specialized skills in various programs of studies that will ensure that they are college, career, and military ready. The goal is to ensure that these students taking CT courses at Mercedes ISD will complete programs of study. Some can complete multiple programs of study and not only limited to one uh, with an industry-based certification and the skills necessary to prepare and advance them for their future. Our plan is that we will provide career awareness, exploration, preparation, and experience in the different career clusters through the different means of recruitment opportunities. And of course our action, some of these things we have already put into place this, this school year. So the, the first one being the CTE Family Fair. Um, that was a great event, we had a great turnout. Our different clubs and organizations were there. We had a lot of community members. We had, um, we had Mercedes PD, the fire department. We had other law enforcement agencies. We had TSTC, STC, uh, military recruiters, uh, local businesses, they were all there and it was great. And the goal is to make it bigger and better for next year. Uh, it being the first one, I, I think it went very, very well. Uh, and actually, before the night was over, I was already thinking, okay, how do we improve for next year? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the plan is to also have more elementary and middle school outreach and visits community involvement, marketing, collaboration with business and industry leaders via advisory board, uh, CTSO, which are those are our organizations, uh, having them uh, take part in competitions and of course those leadership events. That way, um, you know, looking forward to all of our agendas next school year once we start, you know, nothing but student recognitions at every single board meeting. So future goals. Now, you know, we have spoken about the, you know, the impact there is, you know, culinary arts um, was impacted by the move that we took, you know, that, that occurred with Mecca moving here to this facility. And so um, I, I'm a firm believer that everything happens for a reason. And it's not a end all be all. I know that there's opportunity on the other side, which is why on the uh, objectives page, you know, I titled it New Horizon. So this is what it is. So the move to Mercedes High School will provide new opportunities and benefits for the culinary arts program. One of them being is that there will no longer be a loss of instructional time due to travel. At the high school, you know, we were waiting for the bus, waiting for the students to load up. Um, if everything went perfectly, it was about maybe what, three, four minutes travel time, maybe five tops. Um, so right there you're losing time at the beginning and then you're losing time at the end of class because we want to make sure that they get back in time for their next class period. We now have more opportunities for recruitment. Now that culinary arts is, is, is based out at the high school, you know, there's gonna be more outreach. It's gonna be a lot more visible. Uh, the instructional setting will include the kitchen for the work-based learning area in one classroom. And in another classroom right across the hallway is gonna be the instructional slash dining area uh, right across the hallway. 
And so I know here that we're all from Mercedes. Um, the classroom that, that culinary arts is being moved into is the old home mech. That's where I took <laughs> class, you know? And it hasn't changed much. It has not changed much. So uh, that space is very limited. And it's very difficult uh, you know, to run both the kitchen aspect, the hands-on aspect, and then, of course, also have the instructional part, which is why we're looking to have it housed in the two classrooms. One for just the hands-on, the cooking, the understanding the kitchen part, implementing those skills, and right across the hallway, having the instructional slash dining setup. Okay, and I will say, um, you know, going back to the outreach for elementary and middle schools, we do have an enrichment program taking place right now over summer school. We have uh, middle school students who have been uh, going to the high school. They are taking part in a construction slash culinary arts uh, enrichment program. So they spend half of their time in the shop and they spend the other half time in the kitchen. And it is amazing seeing girls using those, those tools and taking those measurements and, and just creating you know, fantastic items in the shop. And then of course seeing boys you know, making, today they made pizza, the other day they made you know, pancakes and, and they're all having fun. They're all having a lot of fun. And so this is exactly what I'm talking about as far as you know, the outreach and giving the, the kids opportunities. Because if it wasn't for this enrichment program taking place right now over the summer, they never would have been exposed to it. Um, I'm sorry, let me see, where did I leave off? Okay, implementation of a practicum class. So the practicum class is another level four. Uh, I had highlighted how food science was a level four course where they could earn their science credit. Let's say a student already has their fourth science. A level four class would be a practicum class. This is where students will operate and oversee a coffee and pastry bar and a salad and sandwich cafe for staff, providing the optimal setting for the practicum experience. So talk about opportunities, you know. Uh, yes, we lost this area, but moving back to the high school, now we are surrounded by more staff. And so the practicum part of it, this is your application. This is where they put what they have learned to the test. And so uh, speaking with Ms. Gonzalez, she would like to set up a coffee and pastry bar for her staff members. You know, that's another way of earning money. But this is all coming from the students. They are operating their entire, you know, uh, program there. And of course, you know, during select days during the week, they would have their salad and sandwich cafe. The beautiful thing is they're making everything in the kitchen and then they're setting up where teachers can sit down, enjoy breakfast, lunch, you know, right across the hallway in that dining slash instructional area. Uh, lastly, there's going to be more opportunities for tutorials before and after school for industry-based certifications. The certifications that we currently offer are the Serve Safe Food Handler and the Serve Safe Food Manager. Okay, and again, going back to certifications, not only does this help our accountability as a whole in the district, but this is giving our kids the upper hand. When they, you know, when they go out, this is something they can put on their resume. Uh, our students who already have these certifications, they could easily go to, you know, Sonic or any other, you know, any other uh, fast food or, you know, restaurant and say, hey, look, it's like, I have the proven skills that are needed. Uh, you do want to hire me. <laughs> and, uh, and again, that's an opportunity that was given to them because of Mercedes ISD, because of our amazing program, um, and we're just giving them the upper hand. And that is it. Any questions? Any questions, guys? Comments? Um, I don't have a question. I have a. I, ju I just have a comment. Um, mm -hmm. your, your CT um, family uh, event, uh, very successful. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I mean, there was so much activity, and there was so much. There was just a little bit of everything, and they were really people were really enjoying themselves. So if you missed out. You missed out. <laughs> Uh, so congratulations on that. That you. was your very, um, I mean, I, I, when I first heard about that, that event that you were going to have, it was, it was something that was, I, I had a feeling it was going to be a great success. So yeah. congratulations thank and you. thank you so much. I have no doubt that you are going to, you know, do something really, really great in the, uh, in the outreach for the middle schools mm -hmm. and elementary schools. Yeah. Um, you already have that plan there, and I can, you know, I can see that. Yeah, one thing that I do want to share um, at the middle schools, one of the classes that we do want to implement for next year, and I've already spoken to the middle school principals, is investigating careers. Mm -hmm. So this is a semester course. At that point, instead of focusing on one specific program of study, mm -hmm. we are going to spread out the different programs of study within a semester. Mm -hmm. And so let's say you, every two to three weeks, you're changing it up. You know, first you're covering culinary arts, then you're covering construction, then you're covering ag, law enforcement, mm -hmm. health science. The goal during that time, you know, let's say, you know, the week two, culinary arts when they're covering it. 
I'm gonna get Ms. Gonzalez a sub. She's gonna go visit Chaco Middle School for the entire day. She's gonna go and visit Harold Middle School for the entire day. At that point, the students get to meet the teacher. They get to talk to the ex expert. Whatever questions they have, there is the time to ask them. She can kind of just give them that, hey, this is the awareness. This is what my program has to offer. And this is a recruitment opportunity that I'm talking about where the teachers are gonna reach out to those kids and already spark that interest. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, we're gonna look at sparking that interest a lot sooner in the elementaries. Thank you, thank mm -hmm. you. Was there a uh, was there a food truck at one at one point? Did did they have some type of a? No, no. Not, not that I, I'm aware I, of. I thought they were selling some some items a while back. So that's. But if we can do it, that's then, yes, that's something that we can I mean, do. At yes. At school, you know, I mean, at the, absolutely. But yeah. thank you so much. Very, thank very, you. Very interesting. Very exciting. Yes. All right. Any other questions? Um, I just have a comment. Mm -hmm. I know that it was hard to accept the move. You know, when you were here going to another, not knowing what the end result was going to be. Mm -hmm. And in talking to the staff and the parents and the teachers, everybody had a concern. But it's nice to hear, Ms. Robo, that you're being very positive about this. Mm -hmm. Even though the move was hard, you're going to make it work. And most often than not, a lot of times when move has occurred, they take it as a negative. Right. And they impact the children and they impact the students and the parents. And you're not doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. You're putting it in a positive light. Mm -hmm. You're making it work. You're actually shining a, a, a strong light on that. Mm -hmm. And that says a lot about you and Ms. Gonzalez, the staff. And that's going to say a lot about your leadership with these children, mm -hmm. that you're not going to let any kind of move change you. On the contrary, you're going to make it work. Right. And that's what Mercedes ISD is all about. It's about right. moving forward, being successful, mm -hmm. and making sure your kid's success no matter where you're at. Right. And that's what it's all about. And I want to thank you thank very, you. very much. Thank you. Ma'am, I'd just like to add, and I want to follow up with Mr. Williams' comment. It's just uh, as a taxpayer. And I've always uh, addressed the board and the community, uh, the return on investment. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we look at those programs, utilizing the students, uh, being very competitive in the market, mm -hmm. I mean, that speaks volumes, ma'am. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I applaud you, ma'am. As a taxpayer, mm -hmm. you know, I've always said it, I pay a lot. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, this, this is fantastic on right. the return on investment. And God bless, mm -hmm. thank you. Right. Anybody have a question, comments? Just a, a thank you for your high energy and your optimism. <laughs> And uh, your 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 vision, do uh, you bring a lot to the to the table? So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ben. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, guys. Moving along with presentation of security guard services RFP number zero six zero seven two two dash three seven three. Dr. Castillo. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. We have three vendors that are going to be presenting tonight. The first one, number one, will be by L4 Security Services, and this will be a video live presentation. Presentation, please, Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, uh, board members, uh, community and staff, uh, Mr. Rowland, uh, if you go down the slide, there you go, right there. Keep going. There you go. The first presentation will be by uh, L4 Security Services. If you scroll down a little bit more, another one. There you go. This is where the presentation will begin. Can you see that, Mr. Chin? Yes, I see that. Thank you. Okay. Let's go ahead and go to the slides, too. We'll start with the thing. And I want to thank everyone for giving us the opportunity to respond to you and giving us this opportunity to present our company. I want to thank all of you. Uh, 
So basically, I know you guys were concerned last time uh, for overtime. So we basically almost guaranteed that there would be no overtime at all. So you have enough uh, personnel to cover both days, shifts, patrols, and even your after school events. Is there any question? Any question, guys? Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, <laughs> sir, I was going to ask you because uh, we just had a, a concerned citizen, and it's a, a, a fair topic. Uh, and I already, I already saw the supporting documents, but I guess it's a rhetorical uh, question, but I just wanted to be on the record. Sir, do you pay the security guards minimum wage? Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, yes, sir. How many, you said you had uh, enough personnel so that the, you wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't accrue any overtime. And that's including uh, extra, extracurricular events. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. We hire enough people to do whatever. Okay, you are you are working um, currently with uh, within our school district, uh, correct? How many uh, how many officers? How many security officers do you have uh, are employed? How many officers? Uh, how many security officers are um, on duty at Mercedes ISD? For the how many? Fifteen. Okay. Okay. And do you um, do you have you have units as well? Uh, marked cars as well? The patrol patrol units. Could you go down to the uh, uh, the timeline slide, please? There yeah. you go. Transition plan. I'm sorry. On on day 25, 30, you said uh, you mentioned continue training, installing equipment. What type of equipment? All right, thank you. And um, I think my last question is, during the time that you've been, uh, that you've had officers here on, with Mercedes ISD, have they actually, um, have they actually been patrolling or securing the, in the campus? Um, we well, we have been patrolling, we've been patrolling, okay. And I, I'm sorry, and I, I know I said it was the last question, but how much experience do your officers have with uh, students, with the, envir the student environment? And what type of training will you provide these uh, security officers? 
uh, it's, it's in regards to student the student environment. Okay. Thank you, sir. Well, Mr. Canales, how many security guards do we have right now, total? Where? For the school, for the district. 21? It's doing OG. But they're in the class, well, they were in the schools. They were in the schools. So today. currently we have 21 with MLG? Yes. And you, you indicated you have 15 hired right now? Yeah. Mr. Chu Chen. Chu. Yes. Yeah, currently we have 15. That's 36. Four times. Yeah. They are working for all your events. Yeah, they rotate. Yeah. They rotate. Okay. And you think with those 15 you'll be able to secure the campus? Campuses? Yes. Yeah, we can actually pull what we need to hire more. We did the contract with you guys. We will definitely hire a lot more personnel. Yeah, because I heard you say if we have enough personnel, we won't have to pay any overtime. That's my concern. Yeah, that's correct. We hire enough personnel for the shifts and enough personnel for uh, the events. We also are hiring people for uh, what we call standby. They're on call. And if you do hire individuals, how long is, is their training that you do for them? When you do hire individuals, how long is the training for them that you do, that you provide? What was that? I didn't. What was? It? Did you break up or he didn't? He speak? broke up. Can you, you broke up. That? Can you repeat that, sir? And do you provide a training to staff? Thank you. Um, sir, I have a couple of questions. Yes. So you indicated that you will not uh, have any overtime, right? Okay. And 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 I mean, and I'm okay with that. I'm, that's uh, my concern is this. Um, you've only provided 15 security guards, so you stated that you'd have to hire more staff, correct? So you have a day shift, and then you're going to have an e evening shift, and then overnight shift? Right. Right. Okay. Well, no. I mean, I'm just going based of what you put on here, and only because of past experiences, I know that uh, the security companies in the past have occurred overtime because there's so much going on, and it's easy to say, no, we're not going to charge overtime, and because you know we want to get a contract, but I just want to make sure that we do not. Uh, lessen the quality of security because there is no overtime. Uh, because I mean, if you, if you, if we're going to have overtime, I mean, we understand, or at least I understand that. I don't know about anybody else, but I understand that uh, because events sometimes don't go as planned, and there's overtime here, or maybe somebody's sick. 
I mean, are you going to take a loss if there is overtime on that? Right. Right. And and I mean that's just only my concern. I, the quality of the security, you know, and and uh, yeah. you know, I'm not in any way trying to to uh, say that it's wrong or it's right. I'm just stating, you know, I would hate to shortchange you too as a company, and then it affect the quality of security for our staff or our students and our staff and our community and our community at the same time. Uh, that, that's all I'm saying, you know. I want to be fair all the way around because in order for you to do a good job, I mean, I want to make sure that you're getting paid properly because you're going to provide security for our kids. And I know that in the past we have kind of talked about overtime and trying to save money, but sometimes in, when it comes to security, we, we, we shouldn't put a number on it to a certain extent because security is very important, you know, and I would hate to shortchange you and that it affect our quality of service for our, for our community. That's all I'm saying. Okay. And so, yeah, um, okay. Okay. Well, I appreciate your time, sir. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any more questions, guys? Okay. Go ahead, uh, sir. The next presentation will be by MLG Protection Services, and we have a representative here. Welcome, sir. And ma'am. And ma'am. And ma'am. <laughs> yes, I did. So yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Welcome, ma'am. It's okay. Yeah. Good evening, Mercedes ISD School Board and community members. My name is Velma Garcia. I'm representing MLG Protection Services. To my left here is Lieutenant uh, Rolando Longoria. He's been with the company also for a little over six years. Mr. Armando Garza uh, sincerely apologizes for not being here. He had to move his son from, graduated from College Station, had to move him for his internship in Washington and was unaware that, you know, we had to be presenting. So I'm the lucky one. <laughs> Crimes take place at banks, schools, malls, supermarkets, entertainment venues, office buildings, and anywhere elsewhere. People go out of their way to rob banks, bring dangerous objects to work or school, prepare to shoplift. They are not afraid to get caught because no one is there to prevent them from doing wrong. For these major reasons, private and government establishments hire security guards to protect not only the premises or the items being sold, but their customers, clients, and students as well. A security guard's mere presence uh, would make them think twice before committing a crime. Protecting properties and staff by hiring security guards or utilizing MLG protection services is what we look forward in doing as a security company. MLG protection services account diversification has allowed us over the years to gain very sophisticated core competencies and expertise in virtually every industry and role. This level of expertise enables us to customize our security guard selection, training services, management support processes to meet the unique needs of each and every client, no matter the complexity or requirements of the business relationship. Um, if you wanna go ahead and scroll down to the next one. This is a little bit about MLG Protection Services. Uh, we were established in 2015. Uh, our owner, Armando Garza, decided that he wanted to continue to serve and protect the community after retiring from the McAllen Police Department. He had served there um, a little over 27 years, and he has been doing so ever since. MLG Protection Services is a full service security contractor, protecting clients, students, staff members, properties, et cetera. We, have, we currently have 300 plus DPS licensed security officers certified in level two, which is unarmed, non-commissioned, level three commissioned, and level four personal protection officers, other, otherwise known as bodyguards, uh, private investigators, and a canine handler. And due to current situations around our communities, we have established our own SRT unit, which is our special response team, which will be readily available in case of an emergency situation with any one of our contracts. We have six Mark Patrol cars and six Mark golf carts available to use with any of our clients as well. 
In the picture above, you're gonna see our canine handler, uh, Sergeant Paul Sanchez. Um, this is our canine, Denzel. He is our, he's our certified canine trainer, former Army Ranger Sergeant Paul Sanchez. Our canine, Denzel, is certified and trained to detect weapons, ammunition, heroin, marijuana, cocaine, and methamphetamines. As an added bonus, which we offer all of our school districts, uh, we will offer five free canine inspections to Mercedes ISD. These five free inspections can be utilized for field trips, locker rooms, school classrooms, backpacks, and career day. And uh, Denzel will be readily available for uh, Mercedes ISD drug free week as well. Our MLG special response team, those are our, that's our uniform. Uh, they're trained for emergency situations. They're led by our owner, Armando Garza, and former Army Ranger Sergeant Paul Sanchez. They will all be armed, they will all be in bulletproof vests, and they will be ready to go at any point in time. MLG Protection Services takes pride in maintaining professionalism, honesty, and integrity when protecting our students, staff, and visitors, properties, etc. Even though all of our guards need to pass a criminal background check to be licensed with the Texas Department of Public Safety, MLG Protection runs an additional DPS background check prior to hiring. Our guards all have a current employee file that is open record for everybody to see. In addition, we randomly drug test employees on a quarterly basis. We also ensure that all of our guards are well informed on all ethical issues, laws, trained and in self-defense, anti-bullying, CPR, and many more. They're all licensed in, the, in at least one of the following, either non-commissioned, commissioned, personal protection, and some of them are on PIs as well. Um, and I'm just gonna, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and agree with Mrs. Uh, Yolanda Molina. She was, uh, she came up here to speak. You know, there, there isn't a, a price tag that you can put on, on, on student safety. And um, I'm just gonna correct her on one little thing. All of our guards that, since I have worked with the company, I started back in uh, October the 1st, 2018. And uh, since I've been there, none of our guards have gotten paid minimum wage. I mean, it, some of the bids here in the Valley are kind of low, especially in the school districts, I understand. Um, you know, funding has gone down a little bit, but um, all of our guards start off, uh, all of our unarmed guards start off at $8 an hour, which is, it is low, you know. Uh, armed guards start off at about 9 or $10 an hour. Um, I understand that here in Mercedes ISD, you know, because of the certain situations that have gone on in our communities, maybe you all are going to be asking for maybe a little bit more armed guards, you know, that we can pay them and train them. Um, we've already done about two or three trainings um, in the last month for armed guards, active shooter trainings and stuff because uh, we are in several school districts, well I will show you right now. But I do agree with her, you know, we have gone up a little bit on our price. Um, when we first started with uh, Mercedes back in 2019, uh, we were at about 1025 and I think we only went up 25 cents since then in three years, you know, and so there is only a certain amount that we can actually pay our guards without actually losing because of workers' comp and, you know, insurance taxes and stuff. Um, so I do agree with her on that. You can't put a price tag on it. All MLG security officers are all uniformed with the company patch shirt, as uh, Lieutenant Longoria is uh, demonstrating right here. Uh, with our security badge, name tag, current DPS license, handcuffs, or any other special requests from our customers, if you're asking for an armed guard, of course they're gonna have their gun. In addition, all MLG security officers are well-groomed, shaved. We're, we try to uh, tell them to hide as many tattoos as they can. And uh, because of student, you know, students are, are watching them and we wanna be role models as well. Uh, being that Armando Garza, Armando Garza president is licensed for various instructional training classes, all guards go through extensive, extensive training throughout the year as needed and, and also continuing education. Our experience in school districts. Um, MLG has over six years of experience working in school districts. We are currently working in Mercedes ISD, Mission CISD, Sherryland ISD, Hidalgo ISD, South Texas ISD, Juan Diego Academy, and Rio Grande Valley College. So as y'all can see, we have an abundance of experience working with students, school staff, and administration to make sure all the schools are safe. Active shooter training, which is something that we are gonna start heavily implementing in all of our school districts. Um, he is, uh, Armando Garza is gonna go ahead, he's the founder of MLG Protective Services and is also an instructor and has trained several school districts and businesses on active shooting situations to prevent any harm or possibilities of these types of scenarios. Our passion is to help and deter our communities from any possible harm. 
If selected, Armando Garza will provide active shooter training to every school staff member absolutely free of charge. We, when, we train, when we train our guards, uh, we train them uh, spe uh, specific techniques on how to de-escalate at-risk students. Uh, this prevents uh, us from any further danger to a student or staff member. De-escalating a situation is important in keeping everyone safe, and that's the first thing that we train our guards when uh, they are properly trained. Our business is located here. We're in Mission. Um, we're in the city of Mission. We're on East Griffin Parkway. That is our phone number. We do everything from billing, payroll, training, investigations. We do everything from there. Um, we have a lot of staff members because we have school districts uh, here in Mercedes, in uh, San Benito, Harlingen, Olmito. So what we do during payroll uh, to help the employees out because, of course, you know, gas is very expensive right now. Since uh, I, I believe since I've worked there, we've always been able to every other Friday when it's payroll, we bring the checks to them and we deliver it to them personally. And usually it's always before one o'clock, you know, that way they can go ahead and cash their checks early. Checks will never be bounced, checks have never been bounced, and they're always readily available for them. But that's an added bonus that we give to our employees. So this is just a little bit about Armando Garza. Uh, he has 28 total years of experience uh, in law enforcement. He has a bachelor's degree of criminal justice. Um, he got it from the University of Texas at Pan American. And those are just some of his acc accolades. Uh, he worked for the McAllen Police Department. He's been the owner of the company since 2014. Uh, he's a level two and level three instructor and, he, and uh, active shooter instructor as well. We do all our in-house, uh, our trainings in-house. So we do have a classroom. Um, we go over the presentation, and then if we actually do uh, level three trainings for the guards, um, we do the in-house training, and then we go to um, his uh, shooting range, and they practice there as well. A little bit more about him. He was part of the bomb squad of McAllen Police for over 10 years, drug interdiction officer, McAllen Police, eight years, HIDA task force, master peace officer, TCLO instructor, NRA instructor, uh, we employ more than now, it's uh, there's a little typo, it's more than 300 security officers till present. And um, the next slide will just show his, um, uh, his bachelor's degree from uh, Texas Pan American and his active shooter license and his masterpiece officer. And because of the situations that have, you know, been arising in our communities, you know, we are also going to be doing like a little extra on our hiring process, uh, like a psychological evaluation form. We're also going to be doing that as well, it's something we never had to do before. But I think um, we're working currently with a, a psychologist to help us out to make it a little bit better and how we can, you know, um, keep events like the ones that are going out around the world from happening. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Any questions, guys? Comments? Thank no, you. Well, just a comment. I guess the same question on, on the overtime. Yes, ma'am. Uh, how do you? Uh, uh, you're also saying you're not going to charge overtime. Mm -hmm. So, um, how do you anticipate not having overtime? Are you going to have enough staff members well, as well? Well, we we have over 300. We, the difference between us and other companies is that we're local. So all of our 90, 99% of the of your staff, of our staff that works for Mercedes ISD lives in Mercedes ISD. Uh, we currently have about 25, because we have some full, some part-time. So we have some roamers as well. Um, and they're all part of the district. So if one of them calls in sick, we have another one readily available within an hour, sometimes two hours. And if not, we have four supervisors that take charge as well. Um, if we have incurred any overtime in the last, I want to say maybe six months, it's been minuscule. I mean, we have not gone over because we have the staff to, you know, uh, to cover it. We haven't had any problems um, in the past as far as that's concerned. Um, but yes, we, what we want to do for our staff, some of our staff that we've had here in Mercedes ISD, um, they've been with us for three years and they've been, you know, uh, the turnaround hasn't been great, 
and that's a good thing I think and we haven't been able to give them that you know raise that we wanted to because you know the bid was so low so we decided to go a little bit higher this time to compensate them you know because they do do a good job and um, um, I mean we're just you know hoping for the best you know but we, we've let them know all the time you know uh, there's great communication and they've done a tremendous job all right thank you uh -huh. Okay, more questions, guys, comments? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, the last one will be by Jet Security. Welcome, sir. Thank you. 
cooperation uh, with our responsibility to connect with uh, food resources uh, to where we can learn about students from certain behaviors uh, to where we can act properly in some certain situations. We have required to that we have to. Uh, security guards, uh, we have over 100 uh, security officers in, the, uh, in, in that region uh, who are fully trained. We uh, supply full uniform from head to toe, from the boot, the pants, the belt, the shirt, the jacket, the hat. There's no excuse for the security officers to show up with no uniform. And we pay for that. We don't take it out of the game for the paycheck. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, when we build contracts, um, we look at the community when we're working, and we hire people that fit the community with speak language. I think that's a, 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 a plus. You, you, you have to ask cars to be able to hear them and to speak language of the leaders in the community. Um, we we're sort of full coverage of the therapy that is included. So we can weekend, uh, weekdays, we uh, weeknights, um, uh, overnight football games, and other events that are requested in the RFP. I know you guys have spoken about the whole time. We don't, we never touch crimes over time. Uh, if, if, if over time happens, we, we take a hit on that. But uh, we have enough of uh, that to where uh, uh, to cover the whole, uh, the whole project, the whole mission. Next slide, please. Why does Jet Security provide the for the Bay School District? Uh, Jet Security is a family operated and uh, we, we run a tight in community. Uh, we care and we take care of our uh, uh, security officers um, and uh, we get each mission very serious. Uh, in the service and operating in Afghanistan and other areas, I understand like, the, the, the importance of security. Uh, it's a safety for your buddy to your right and your left. Uh, and it's a safety for the whole team. Um, I believe the right company, um, it, it, the, the right security company is mission success. Uh, any questions, guys? Comments? Anyone? Yes, sir. Uh, no more questions, sir. No, no <coughs> comments. Thank you so much, sir. Oh, Mr. Gal, you have no, a question? No, I, I'm still reading the. But no, no. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you, sir. Okay, that basically uh, concludes our presentation on the security guards. We move along on the agenda to our action agenda. A, business office. Discussion of possible action to award security guard services RFP number 060722-373. Uh, Dr. Castillo. Yes, uh, administration recommends approval to award security guard services RFP number 060722-373 to L4 Security Services as recommended by the committee. Okay, we have a recommendation from the administration. May I entertain a motion? Uh, recommend a, I need a, a motion, guys, to discuss the actual item. Mr. Going, going, going. Mr. Chairman, I, I just. Um, you have to make a. You have yeah, to make a motion. Yeah. To go. Okay. Cannot discuss. We need to have a motion on the floor, on the table there, on the floor. Sorry. I will make a motion to uh, so move. Okay, I have a motion from Mrs. Delgado. Can I have a second? Second. I have a second from Ms. Howe. Okay, guys, uh, let's have a discussion about it. Even though I, I mean, I, my motion to move with the recommendation, um, I have questions, and I'm not sure if if we were thorough with the uh, the questions or or the the criteria, you know, the um, reference checks. Did we do reference checks? Did we call? Did we call to the? Uh, um, you know, because I know that L4 and MLG have been with us for a while, but have we looked into um, maybe there's any other issues with any other the district? Um, I'm going to refer the question to Mr. Gonzalez, our purchasing okay. director. 
I had not checked the references yet because due to the time frame, I did not have enough time to check for the references. Are we allowed to table the well? Table there's a well. A there's a time? motion on the table. So, right. uh, uh, Tony, can we amend it? No, we have to. We have to follow through, right? Yeah, so we she, have to follow through. Because she, her, yeah, because she resend, she can't resend You can resend the motion if you like, and, and then table the item. Table the item. I, I would like to do that. Uh, I would like to resend uh, for for the reason that we we do need to be thorough. We we. Uh, with everything that has been, everything that we've gone through, um, you know, we, we can't let it to chance. We, we have to be very thorough, and um, we know what we, what we want, what we need, actually. And it's not, you know, if you were out of time or if it was just, you know, too much, too fast, uh, I mean, that's understandable as well. Um, I know you, we're trying to meet deadlines, but I think I feel like we do need to ask a little bit more questions. We do need to look into a little bit of, of, of reference checks. That's yeah, we had, uh, we had that issue before uh, yeah. last year, you recall. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the superintendent was on the, on the record saying that she had forgotten. That's, that's on the record. And, uh, you know, for the sake of transparency, uh, I think uh, for what it's worth, I, we got to look at those reference. I mean, that's basically that's our role. Is. Well, Joe. Because we went, I'm sorry, let me uh, correct that. I went through the, the uh, point documentation and I didn't see the reference checks. So, yes. Make sure we take a look at it. Uh, Tony, do we, so we have to have a second on it? Do we have to vote on the rescinding or no? Yeah. I'll second the re to, okay. to rescind. I appreciate your honesty, sir. Thank, Thank you, you so sir. much. Thank you. It, it means a lot. So, Mr. Howell, you uh, second the resend? Yeah, second on the uh, resend and table the uh, motion. Well, let's the table. do that one first, okay. Guys, uh, any more questions, comments? Okay. All right, so mm -hmm. we have a uh, motion from Ms. Legal uh, to resend, uh, a second from uh, Mr. Howell. All in favor of saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed by saying no? Okay, the resending um, motion has passed. Um, well, we're still back to uh, A1, guys, so I need a motion. I need to entertain to motion, motion to the table. Okay, I have uh, a motion from Mr. Howe. Can I have a second? Second. Second. Any discussion on it, guys, so we can move on, right? When, when will we re revisit this? That's a great question. I guess um, the, the, the motion of the table requires it to be brought back to the next meeting. Okay, you want you want to amend that one, uh, Mr. Howe? No, I mean, no, we can do it from there. Okay. Um, At least you know it's coming back. Yeah. This okay. Yeah, as soon as possible, Mr. Yeah. So I guess we can talk to Dr. Castillo about that, mm -hmm. see if we can. And we would still to... keep these three, we would still, with these top three, right? And, and bring them back to the can next Can we do meet. that, Tony? Can we just, well, we or do we have to? presentation all over again? They're going to have to do it all over because it may affect the ranking. Yeah. Well, they don't have to present again, right? No, they don't have to present again unless the administration would like to present again or it's a board request, but it may affect the ranking, depending mm -hmm. on the reference checks, right? And mm -hmm. just put it on there. Okay. We'll, we'll take the check. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll take yeah. it. Everybody no, okay? We don't want to prolong it. Like no, yeah. no, 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 we're, no. No, no as we soon don't. As possible, we don't. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I think we know what we need, and uh, I think we know what, you know, what's important. So we, we've been through it. We've been through it. Yes. You yeah. know, we're we experiencing the, that. We so. had the discussion so, already, guys. Yeah. So. yeah. And okay. uh, yeah, just so long as we don't go too long because yeah, the last time we ran exactly. into a lot of problems and no, they won't. also need whoever gets the bid needs to be trained and yes. together with our eros and, staff our, and, and, and our safe schools need time also yeah. to talk to them and you know so mm -hmm. okay gotta mm -hmm. take that into consideration too absolutely mm -hmm. thank you all right guys well mm -hmm. any more discussion any comments guys? okay yes. so i have a motion for mr house second from mr Howell. all in favor by saying aye Aye. 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 Anyone opposed by saying no? Okay. Motion passes. Let's move along, guys.
to discuss the possible action to award the uh, food services consultant for RFP number 051022-368. Dr. Castillo. Mr. Chairman, at this time, administration recommends no action to ta be taken on this item. Okay. Uh, let's move along to uh, three. Correct, uh, Tony, right? Correct. Discussion of possible action to award the external auditor's RFQ number 060722-372. Dr. Castillo. Administration recommends approval to award external auditors RFQ number 060722-372 to Costco's and Associates. Okay, may I entertain a motion, guys? So we have a recommendation from the from administration, sorry. So moved. Okay, I have a motion from Ms. Trino. Mm -hmm. May I have a second? Second. Second from Ms. Delgado. Okay, this, uh, discussion, guys. They were the same ones that were that did it last year, correct? Yes. Okay. So they're familiar with our with our process and Okay. Anybody questions, comments, guys? Alrighty. So uh, I have a motion for Mr. Vino, second from Mr. Gal. All in favor by saying aye. All right. Aye. 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 Anyone anyone opposed by saying no? Okay, then move along. Motion passes unanimous. Four, discussion of possible action to approve the 2021-2022 Budget Amendment General Operation Number 5. Dr. Castillo. Mr. Chairman, administration recommends approval of 2021-22 Budget Amendment General Operation Number 5. Okay, we have a recommendation from administration. My, may I entertain a motion? Motion. I have a motion from Mr. Martinez. Second? I'll second it. We have a second from Mr. Garza. Okay, discussion guys. What exactly is the amendment? Ms. Delia Garcia. The budget amendment number five sets up the budget for the um, Mercedes Early College Academy relocation. Um, as you can see on the right hand column, the $2.2 million that was, um, it's, that was committed in the last meeting, in their last regular board meeting, uh, it's, it's going to come out of fund balance. So 2.2 million is coming out of the fund balance. Right. That's correct. Right. Thank you. Okay, any discussion, guys? Okay, so that, well, no more discussion. Uh, we have a motion from Mr. Uh, Martinez, second from Mr. Garza. All in favor of saying aye? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed by saying no? No. Okay, we have um, one, two, three, four, five, five to one. Motion pass. On to the next one. Number five, discussion of possible action to award fuel can uh, canopy RFP number 052522-369. Dr. Castillo. Mr. Chairman, administration recommends approval to award fuel canopy RFP number 052522-369 to SLR building contractors. Okay, we have a recommendation from administration. May I, may I entertain a motion? So moved. Okay, I have a motion from Mr. Garza. Second? Second. May I have a second, Mrs. Garza? I mean, Ms. Delgado, thank you. Mm-hmm. All right, guys, uh, discussion. No. Okay, is there no more discussion? Um, let's follow along with uh, the motion from Mr. Garza, seconded by Mr. Gal. All in favor by saying aye? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, motion passes unanimous. Uh, six, Discussion possible action to award the drug and alcohol testing RFP number 0525-2022-371. Dr. Castillo. Mr. Chairman, administration recommends approval to award drug and alcohol testing RFP number 0525-2022-371 to I check you drug and alcohol testing. Okay, we have a recommendation from administration. Uh, I need a motion, guys. Motion. Okay, a motion from Mr. Martinez. Second. 
I'll second it. Second for uh, Mr. Garza. Okay, discussion, guys. Well, the only question that I just want to put it on the record, uh, Dr. Seal, so it's it's not like we're going to do it every every week. We're just doing it as needed, correct? Uh, Mr. Torres, right? Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez. I'm sorry, what was the question again, sir? Uh, what's that? It's it's on the, under the discretion of the administration. Okay, it's it's answered already, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank thank you. <coughs> Okay, um, any more questions, guys, comments? Okay, let's, pretty much concludes our discussion. Uh, we have a motion from Mr. Martinez, second from Mr. Garza. On fair by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed by saying no? Okay, unanimous, motion passes. Number seven. Discussion possible action to approve the request to re-advertise for the gutter system, RFP number 052522-370 for uh, Sergeant Chacon Middle School. Dr. Garcia. Mr. Chairman, administration recommends approval to request to re-advertise for the gutter system, RFP number 052522-370 for Sergeant Chacon Middle School. Okay, we have a recommendation from administration, guys. Uh, I need a motion. So moved. So moved from? From Mr. Howe. Thank you, Mr. Howe. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Vino. Okay, guys, uh, discussion. Okay, so if there's no discussion. Let's move along. We have uh, a motion from Mr. Howe, a second by Mr. Vino. All in favor by saying aye. All right. Aye. 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 Anyone opposed by saying no? Okay, uh, motion passes. B, governance. One, discussion positive action on order calling for the Mercedes ISD school board election to be held on Tuesday, November 8th, 2022 for places one, two, three, and four. Uh, I guess Dr. Garcia. Mr. Chairman, this requires board approval. Board action. Board action, right. Okay. Okay, so you uh, know a motion? So moved. Okay, so we have a motion for Mr. Trevino. Second. Second for uh, Mr. Trejo. Any discussion? Uh, other than uh, good luck, guys. <laughs> right. <laughs> Any other discussion, guys? <laughs> Comments? Okay, so we have a motion from Mr. Vino, a second from Mr. Howe. All in favor by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed by saying no? <coughs> motion passes. Okay. Let me get my notes here, guys. Hold on. Okay, the consent agenda, guys. So I um, guess start from the right to the left, right? Mr. Vino, you want to? Pull anything from the consent agenda? Uh, no, sir. Mr. Garza? No, sir, not at this time. Mr. Howe? No, sir. Uh, Mr. Martinez? No. Ms. Delgado? No, sir. No. Okay, and yeah, I'm not going to pull anything out there. Okay. I do need to inform you that on item E, number two, if approved, administration is pending a current agreement with our new board president, Stick Signature. And yeah. upon receiving it, we will uh, bring it for signature. Ooh, Tony, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Just it's making a note, it's, right? It's not a substantive change. Okay. For well, guys, I need a motion to accept the consent in all entirety. So moved. Okay, I have a uh, motion for Mr. Garza. Second, please. Second. Second for Mr. Vino. Any discussion, guys? Okay. That pretty much finishes our discussion, right? All in favor by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed by saying no? Okay, motion passes. Unite. Second session. Bear with me, guys. Gotta read all this. And hopefully, I'm gonna fight in English.
Second session A, personnel pursuant to section 551.074 of the Texas Government Code and attorney consultation pursuant to section 551.071 of the Texas Government Code. One, resignation, terminations, appointments, evaluation, reassignments, duties, and discipline of professional, paraprofessional, and non-contract employees. Teacher substitutes and substitutes for maintenance, transportation, cafeteria, department. Two, discussion and consideration regarding placement for superintendent on paid administrative leave. Three, discussion and consideration to appoint an interim superintendent or name an acting superintendent. Four, discussion and consideration of delegation of authority to negotiate interim or acting superintendent agreement. Five, discussion and consideration of superintendent's contract to include the discussion and consideration of the resignation agreement. B, student discipline. C, security pursuant to section 551.076 and 551.071 of the Texas Government Code. D, discussion and consideration of contemplated personnel investigations. E, discussion and private consultation with the attorney regarding pending or contemplated litigation, settlement matters and or matters where the professional duty under the state board requires private consultation with the school attorney. It is 844 and this school board is in executive session. <laughs> <laughs> 